Good afternoon and welcome to today's webcast, brought to you by the Center on Knowledge Translation for Disability and Rehabilitation Research, or KTDRR, at American Institutes for Research, in coordination with the Campbell Collaboration. The Center on KTDRR is funded by the National Institute on Disability, Independent Living, and Rehabilitation Research, known as NIDLR, in the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, Administration for Community Living. The Campbell Collaboration is an international organization that promotes positive change through the production and use of systematic reviews and other evidence synthesis for evidence-based policy and practice. The Center on KTDRR partners with the Campbell's Disability Coordinating Group, or DCG. I'm Joanne Starks with the Austin Office of American Institutes for Research, or AIR, and I will be the moderator today. I also want to thank my colleague Shoshana Rabinowski, who is helping with the logistics. The KTDRR Center and the Campbell Collaboration are working together to offer a five-part training course that focuses on high-quality methods for synthesis of evidence, including the procedures and methods for conducting systematic reviews and research syntheses, as well as software, tools, and strategies for analyzing and reporting data. This first session, an overview of systematic review and research synthesis, describes the benefits of evidence from systematic reviews, some different types of reviews, and looks at the differences between systematic review and research synthesis. Now I'd like to introduce our speaker. Dr. Terry Piggott is Associate Provost for Research and Professor of Research Methodology at Loyola University, Chicago, and she is the former Dean of the School of Education there. She is currently the Senior Methods Editor of the Campbell Collaboration Editorial Board and the co-editor of the Campbell Collaboration Methods Group. Dr. Piggott received the Frederick Mosteller Award for Distinctive Contributions to Systematic Reviewing from the Campbell Collaboration in 2016, and she's an author on six completed Campbell reviews. She has served on a number of editorial boards and is the founding chair of the American Educational Research Association Special Interest Group on Systematic Review and Meta-Analysis and she's a member of the Society for Research Synthesis Methodology. Now let's get started. Thank you, Joanne, and welcome, everyone. Um, so I want to start with our goals for the presentation today. So today we, um, I'm going to uh, discuss sort of the rationale for why we would do a systematic review and meta-analysis. I'm also going to describe the different types of reviews um, that we might encounter in the literature. And then um, sort of give a little bit of a preview of overview of the stages of a systematic review and meta-analysis. Although we, we will really deal with those issues in the, um, in the upcoming webinar um, in March. We'll go into more detail about um, stages of systematic review and meta-analysis. So, Let's start with the big question. Why use systematic review and meta-analysis anyway? So we'll start with the, uh, the definition of systematic review. Um, so from uh, uh, Mark Pettigrew and Helen Roberts' book uh, from 2006, a systematic review is a review that strives to comprehensively identify, appraise, and synthesize all the relevant studies on a given topic. So we, I use the term systematic review to think about um, to, to describe the activities of really trying to get all of the studies on a given topic and try to understand what they are all saying. Um, and so as um, Pettigrew and Robert say in the second quote here, it's a method of making sense of a large body of information um, and a means of contributing answers to questions about what works, especially when we're looking at systematic reviews of interventions, and what doesn't work, and many other kinds of questions um, as well. So the essential goals of a systematic review are, as I have alluded to, um, to summarize existing empirical research, um, but to inform policy and practice. So we want to really understand what we've done, wh what kind of what we know about the literature in some given area, in order for us to to actually um, uh, uh, make the world a better place in, in some respects. Um, it also provides us directions for future research. If we're looking at a whole body of literature, if we really do um, get 
a handle on what we've done so far, it also gives us an idea of what we haven't done and provides some directions for future research. And then the other essential goal of a systematic review um, is to use repl replicable and transparent methods to summarize existing research. We know how to do a, a very good primary study. We have a scientific method that we've used to, to, um, to get um, good primary study data. We want to use those same scientific techniques also in order to review and synthesize a whole other set of data. Okay. Um, Another piece of rationale or reason why we want to use systematic review is that examining the results of multiple studies provides much stronger evidence than results from a single study. I think we can all think of an example where a single study um, has had or can have undue influence on practice and policy. And we also know that single studies have limitations in their design, their generalizability, um, maybe in how an intervention was implemented and so forth. Um, so that uh, uh, using systematic review can um, help us understand a whole body of literature where all the studies may have a little bit of, um, maybe have a few limitations, but as a whole, the body of literature says something that a single study cannot. And we also don't use single subject designs to assess public opinion. Um, and so we shouldn't do that also. Um, when we're making policy decisions um, in a given um, area. Another um, uh, compelling reason to use systematic reviews is that systematic reviews can provide us opportunities to examine variation across studies that are not possible in a single study. If we have multiple studies, we can actually ask the question about why, studies result, why study results might differ differ or vary from each other? Is it because all these different studies are using different research designs or different samples or have different implementation of the intervention or are um, implemented in different contexts or use different measures, for example? So meta-analysis, which is part of a, um, a technique you can use in a systematic review, can help us statistically examine associations between study results and variation in methods across studies. So I have a little illustrative example here on the left of the slide. This is made up. But um, for example, this is a, um, an illustration of effect size, the relationship of effect size to the percent of females in the intervention sample. And what we can see in this illustrative picture is that effect sizes, um, studies with um, higher percentage of females in the intervention sample tend to be um, tend to have higher um, effect sizes. Okay. So um, what I'm going to do right now is um, we're going to examine uh, one particular study so I can again show you um, and illustrate some of the uh, reasons why systematic review um, and meta-analysis is important. So this particular study, there's a reference at the bottom of the slide here, is um, from Julia Littell, um, uh, entitled if Evidence-Based or Biased, the Quality of Published Reviews of Evidence-Based Practices. And this particular study examined the quality of um, traditional narrative reviews studying a particular intervention called multisystemic therapy for treating youth with a range of behavioral challenges. This is sort of a wraparound um, intervention for helping students who are in, um, in, um, in danger of, of, of actually getting into the criminal justice system. So one part of this particular study examined how each of the, of the narrative reviews characterized the results of a single primary study on multisystemic therapy. So we're going to first look at the results of, of one study, and then we're going to look at how the narrative reviews using that study characterize its results. Okay. So one study that was included in um, the Littell piece is a study by Bronk, Hengler, and Whalen um, comparing multisystemic therapy and parent training um, uh, in, the brief, in a brief treatment intervention of child abuse and neglect. So there were 43 studies, I'm sorry, 43 families of abused and neglected children uh, in this particular study randomly assigned either to parent training 
or to multisystemic therapy. Um, 33 of the 43 families actually completed the treatment and provided data on all the outcomes. So there was some attrition in this particular study. Um, and they collected data on 30 outcomes, um, uh, which includes both the primary scales and their um, subscales. So this is a little sort of graphic presentation of the results that this study obtained, um, of comparing parent training and multisystemic therapy. Uh, the little white squares are, are um, the outcomes. So there's 30 outcomes represented here. The white squares are the outcomes where there was no significant difference between parent training and multisystemic therapy. Um, uh, the green boxes are outcomes where multisystemic therapy um, led to better outcomes for the families than the parent training. The red boxes are outcomes where the parent training um, uh, outcomes were better for parent training than for multisystemic therapy. And the gray one is an outcome that, uh, that was measured in the study but was never reported on in any of the um, subsequent papers. Okay. So the uh, primary study in interpreting the res results, so if you look up the primary study, um, data was provided on all seven statistically significant results in the paper. Um, and then 12 of the 22 non-significant results were actually um, recorded and reported in the study. Um, and the study uses a, used a series of man, uh, MANOVAs um, with groups of measures to look at the uh, results. So you'll see right, right away, I um, just want to point out that there's some outcome reporting bias here. We don't know what happened with the gray, um, the gray outcome and 12 um, or 10 of the non-significant results are not actually provided in the text of the paper. Okay. So what I want to do next is say, okay, so, um, so wait, one more slide I think here. So what um, Brunk et al. said was that both groups showed decreased psychiatric symptoms, reduced stress, and reduced severity of identified problems. So both, um, both parent training and multisystemic therapy were effective in, um, in decreasing some um, uh, some symptoms in uh, the families, but that multisystemic therapy was more effective than parent training at restructuring parent-child relations, but parent training was more effective than MST, multisystemic therapy, at reducing identified social problems. So what I've given you now is just sort of a, uh, a summary of what the primary authors have found in their particular study. Let's now look at how narrative reviews report on the results of this study. So one review by Burns et al., um, of what the little blue box in the middle shows you what, they fo what Burns et al. focused on when they were reporting on the Bronx study. So they focused on decreases in psychiatric symptoms and reduced overall stress. So they talk about um, both, both interventions were effective there. And then um, Ann also talked about MST, improving parent-child relations. Uh, note, though, that they only talk about five of the 30 outcomes that were actually reported in the study, and they focus on two of the, um, two of the significant ones that were significant in favor of MST, three that had no differences, and they do not talk in specifically about any of the outcomes where parent training was superior to um, MST. So that's one, one narrative reviews description. Here's a second one down at... Um, on the, also in the blue part of the slide, on the, uh, the second piece, the Corcoran piece, in this particular case, they focused on three of the outcomes, three of the five outcomes that were in favor of uh, MST, four of the 22 outcomes that where there were no difference, and they found three outcomes for parent training. We're not sure where that third outcome came from that were in um, favor of, of parent training. And so here's just a little uh, a, a summary of a, of a whole set of published reviews, um, discussions of that single study that we just talked about. So you can see that each of these uh, narrative, traditional narrative reviews focused on different parts of that single study. And we might make the case that, this, that no single one of these narrative reviews has actually captured the complexity of the results in that particular study. 
Okay. Um, most of these reviews used a single phrase to characterize the results of the Bronx study and highlight, and most of them highlighted the advantages of, of multisystemic therapy and didn't say anything about the advantages of parent training. And most of the reviews in discussion of this particular single study ignored valuable information on the relative advantages, disadvantages, and the equivalent results um, of parent training. So, so let's look in even more detail about what happened in these particular narrative reviews that used the Bronk um, study. Um, there were 86, over 86 reviews of multisystemic therapy published after 1996. In fact, there were more reviews than primary studies. The Littell 2008 um, uh, study assessed 66 of these reviews and found that many of them were actually what was characterized as light reviews, meaning they relied on other reviews. So they referenced each other um, in discussing um, uh, the results of primary studies on MST. And 37 of the reviews included cited one or more of the primary studies. So Littell 2008 actually looked more, even more closely at these 37 reviews that cited one or more primary studies as opposed to citing other reviews. Um, in these 37 reviews that cited one or more primary studies, most of them were traditional narrative summaries of convenient samples of the published reports of MST. Most of them concluded that MST worked, was consistently more effective than alternatives, and um, some of these reviews concluded that MST was effective across problems, populations, and settings. Um, and most of them cited Brunk as uh, one of the only studies that showed evidence for the effects of MST in cases of child abuse and neglect. So we can compare that um, 2000, uh, what these 66 or 37 reviews actually found to an actual systematic review of MST, which Julia Littell did in 2005. Um, this is using all the systematic review techniques that you will learn about in the second webinar. But what um, Julia found in this, in a systematic review of MST, was that effects were not consistent across studies. There were very few studies, and most were conducted by the program developers, and most of these studies were conducted in the U.S. And all of the studies had mixed results across outcomes, um, except for those that actually found no results or null results on outcomes. So, so Julia Littell's 2005 systematic review on multisystemic therapy was actually contrary to the conclusions of most of these published narrative reviews, which suggested that the effectiveness of MST was well established and consistent across studies. Um, Oh, I see there's a question here about a narrative review as opposed to a systematic review. I, I think that's a good question to stop and talk about. So what we, I mean by a narrative, um, a narrative review is, when, um, is what we think about in uh, a, a traditional narrative review gets a whole bunch, gets a set of studies and then um, in an essay form discusses their results. Um, and, um, and this is in, in, in a narrative review as opposed to a systematic review. In a systematic review, we have very clear ways of how to identify the numbers, um, the studies that will be included into the review. In a narrative review, which tends to um, be more argument-based, we might not know how the studies were selected into the review. And that is a very important point. So when I'm, when I'm using this, um, this language about narrative reviews, I'm also talking about reviews where we're not sure how the studies were, um, what decisions were made about how the, the, the studies were actually um, included in the review. In a systematic review, we have to be very upfront about what our inclusion criteria are, and we have to be, have very clear searching strategies and transparent ways of getting um, uh, studies into review. So thank you for that. Okay. So um, 
And you can see why this is important, why I needed to stop and talk about that. Because what I want to talk about is the potential bias in traditional narrative reviews when we don't know how the studies were selected to be in the review. And, and the potential bias comes from, um, from sort of three major areas. Um, general selection bias, so a lack of transparency for how studies are included. And I'm going to talk in a second about publication bias. Um, dissemination bias, and confirmation and, and allegiance bias. I'm also going to talk a little bit about outcome reporting bias. That tends to be uh, more of a problem in traditional narrative reviews. Um, and then I'm also going to talk about the use of cognitive algebra um, um, to synthesize results. Okay. So a potential problem if we don't know in a traditional narrative review, if we don't know how studies um, get in. Um, is publication bias. Narrative, traditional narrative reviews have tended to rely on the published literature. But we also know, which is I think pretty clear now, that published studies are three times more likely to be published than similar studies with null or negative results. Um, the reference I have there to Song et al. Um, is, uh, is in the health, um, in the area of health um, research. Um, we also know that in education, for example, effects, um, published studies have effect sizes that are larger, about 0.19 standard deviations larger than unpublished studies. And the sources of publication bias are complex. Um, uh, we know, for example, that investigators are less likely to submit null results for conference presentations and for publications. These are um, well documented in empirical studies in the literature, mostly in medicine, but they have also been um, replicated in, in the social sciences, particularly psychology. And the, we also know that peer reviewers and editors are less likely to accept and publish null results. So in a traditional narrative review, if we're only relying on published studies, we're going to have a tendency to get studies with larger effects. Another way selection bias might occur if we're only relying on, um, on published results is dissemination bias. So that studies with significant results are also published faster, cited and reprinted more often, more likely to be um, published in English than in other languages, and easier to locate. So if we're only relying on the published literature as we do in traditional narrative reviews, we are again going to um, we're perhaps going to be um, to have a biased sample and biased um, understanding of, of the results of particular studies in an area. Okay. Um, another way that we can be biased if we're not using systematic review techniques that have clear selection criteria for studies in the review is that we can tend to be to fall prey to confirmation and allegiance bias. Um, if we're of course, if I am making an argument um, that I want, I want to convince people, I'm going to have a tendency to seek and accept information that confirms my prior expectations or hypotheses and ignore evidence to the contrary. So if I'm doing a traditional narrative review and I don't, I'm not upfront and transparent about how I'm um, selecting studies into my review, I am probably going to um, you know, uh, be in danger of just selecting those studies that confirm my, my already um, strongly held opinion. Um, and the same thing um, operates in, with allegiance bias. Um, we know that researchers' preferences can, per, can sometimes predict results. So. Okay. Um, another, another danger, if we're only relying on published studies and we're not upfront about our selection criteria for studies, um, is that in um, traditional narrative reviews tend to report on the statistical um, on the statistically significant results from a primary study, and I think we saw that um, in in the Littell um, piece that most of the reviews um, on MST focused on those statistically significant results as opposed to looking at those results that were um, not statistically significant. So within primary studies that have mixed results, we see that. Significant results are also more likely to be reported or mentioned at all, and also more likely to be fully reported. Um, there is um, active research on outcome reporting bias in medicine. There's a very um, interesting study by Vadula um, 
on reporting bias, um, uh, on the effects, on the off-indication effects of a drug called gabapentin. And then I have also um, contributed to this in, in education. Finally, another sort of danger of, um, of traditional narrative reviews, uh, as opposed to using systematic review techniques with meta-analysis, is just that we tend to use what um, a colleague of mine calls cognitive algebra to synthesize results. We know that primary studies are, are complex. They include many measures, many statistical analyses, and that makes um, making a narrative summary difficult. I mean, there's a tendency for us to try to make, um, try to get clarity and try to simplify a complex uh, a set of information. So there's a tendency for us just to count up the number of results that support or that don't support a given hypothesis. And this is a procedure that we call vote counting. Uh, the problem is that vote counting does not provide statistically defensible results, given that um, many primary studies um, have power issues. So, uh, so that we, in, in times of complex, um, uh, a complex amount of information, we will tend to try to make it simpler. And um, many narrative reviews focus on just counting up the number of results either for or against a given hypothesis, which is not a good thing to do. Okay. Um, and this, this use of cognitive algebra reminds me of the um, Daniel Kahneman book, Thinking Fast and Slow. And I won't read to you the quote there, but it's another part of, of the way our brains work. We really want to, to get to a simple explanation. And so we have a tendency to pay more attention um, uh, we, to pay more attention uh, to simplify our in, the information around us rather than to think um, more, more carefully and more complexly. Okay. Um, so systematic reviews are actually then an alternative to the kinds of bias and error that might occur in, in traditional narrative reviews that aren't using trans, um, uh, a clear and replicable uh, methods for getting a set of, of studies into a review. So what we try to do in systematic reviews is to develop and follow a predetermined plan or protocol and use transparent, well-documented, and replicable procedures for the entire process, both to locate studies that will be included in the review, to analyze those studies, and to synthesize those studies in order to come to some conclusion about what is happening in a particular um, given literature. Okay. So what we do to um, avoid and reduce bias and error is to set explicit inclusion and exclusion criteria about the studies that will be um, in the review um, that anyone can actually look at and also um, take issue with if that's the case. We develop and document strategies for locating all relevant studies regardless of their publication status. Um, we focus and, um, and attend to inter-rater agreement or reliability on key decisions that happen in a systematic review, particularly around extraction of data from the primary studies, um, coding of those studies. We formally um, assess the study quality um, of the primary studies in our review so we understand how, what, what the strength of evidence is. And then we use meta-analysis when possible to synthesize those results across studies. Um, so I thought it might be a good time to talk a little bit about what meta-analysis is. I use meta-analysis as the term for the set of statistical techniques we use to synthesize quantitative results from a set of studies. So meta-analysis techniques include both methods for estimating the average effect um, of, say, a treatment across a set of studies, and also the variance of that average effect. Um, we, meta-analysis techniques also exist for exploring the variation across study results. Why do, why aren't we getting the same treatment effect across studies? Is it associated with differences across studies in the, the patients or population that are in the studies, in the context, um, in how well the um, intervention was implemented, and so forth? 
And then also meta-analysis techniques exist to examine um, the sensitivity of our results to potential bias. I also want to note here that um, systematic reviews and meta-analyses um, can be distinct. So for example, systematic reviews might not include a meta-analysis. So you might go ahead and use systematic review techniques um, to gather up a set of studies, but you might not use meta-analysis to actually synthesize them. You may, you may actually use narrative ways of talking about the studies. Um, or you might have multiple meta-analyses. And it's also important to note that meta-analyses are not always based on systematic reviews. Some meta-analyses may also fall into the same trap as traditional narrative reviews and just use a convenient sample of published studies. And then they are vulnerable to the same kinds of biases as I've been talking about with traditional narrative reviews. Okay. So now that I've talked to you a little bit about um, why we would do systematic reviews and given you some um, rationale for why they're important and shown you some of the biases that can uh, result if you don't use systematic review techniques, I wanted to um, just stop and talk um, briefly about um, different purposes for systematic reviews and the different kinds of systematic reviews you might encounter in the literature. So. Um, Goff, Oliver, and Thomas um, discuss a, a one major difference, um, one dif a difference between systematic reviews aimed at what they call configuration versus aggregation. So there are a whole set of systematic reviews that are really called configurative synthesis. And this involves interpretive conceptual analysis um, of a set of studies. So you use systematic review techniques to gather a what we um, uh, a representative sample or all of the all of the studies on a given topic, but your uh, the purpose of your analysis is to really look at the concepts um, and have, get a conceptual understanding of this set of studies, um, and that is in um, in contrast to what we've really been talking about today, which is aggregative syntheses, where really what we're interested in is summarizing the quantitative data from a set of studies and, when possible, using meta-analysis. So we really want to aggregate these studies in some way to understand what the treatment effect is, for example, across the studies, rather than in a configurative synthesis where maybe we're interested in how is disability, for example, defined um, across a set of studies. Okay. Um, I, Another um, kind of um, review that is, is um, I've, I've been seeing more of in the literature are, is this thing called evidence and gap maps. So this is a way of sort of mapping the literature. So we use systematic review techniques to identify studies that we are, um, that are going to be um, eligible for a given um, review. And then we organize them into a map. Um, so this gives us a sense of understanding sort of the landscape of research that exists on a given topic. So typically, and I'll show you one in a second, typically the rows of the map are interventions and the columns are outcomes. Um, 3IE uh, is an international organization on impact evaluation, and also the Campbell of, um, Collaboration have produced a number of these maps, and they're, they're really interesting, and I um, will, um, urge you to, to click on these um, uh, links here. Um, here's just a quick uh, a picture of a evidence um, gap map from 3IE. These are about uh, interventions to provide youth with, with transferable skills. So you, you know, it's hard to read, but you can see the rows are different kinds of interventions, um, like providing teacher incentives, for example, to, um, to teach transfer, transferable skills or um, having actual courses on transferable skills. And then the columns are a different outcomes, learning and behavior outcomes. And what you see there, those little, the, the size of the gray dots in those cells show, um, are proportional to the number of studies that exist uh, that look at that intervention and that outcome. So, uh, so this is one way of using systematic review techniques to examine a set of literature. Okay, and this just gives you sort of a 
set of, um, gives you where the evidence actually lies. And you can see there's some interventions here where we have no, we actually have no um, primary studies. Okay. So other review strategies you might hear about in the literature. Um, one is, a, is scoping reviews. So scoping reviews are typically used to understand how many studies might exist in the literature. So here you might want to know if it's worthwhile to actually do a systematic review with a meta-analysis or not. Um, are the, is there enough body of, is there enough um, evidence in the, in the literature base to actually do a review? And on scoping reviews, um, you have to be careful because they can either use systematic or unsystematic ways to search the literature. Um, uh, sometimes we use them in a very informal way when we're writing, um, when we're trying to figure out if, again, if it's worthwhile to, um, if the literature is at a point in which it's important to do a review. Um, you might also hear about rapid evidence assessment. So rapid evidence assessments. Um, are reviews that are conducted on a short timeline, usually in direct response to some time-sensitive policy questions. So there may be a policymaker out there who really wants to make a decision about um, whether or not they're going to go forward with some intervention, and so they ask um, researchers to produce a very quick um, evidence assessment. Typically, um, uh, rapid evidence assessments involve limited, a limited literature search. Um, for example, limited to, uh, pub to published literature example and limited coding and analysis strategy. Um, once you, uh, not to, not to uh, uh, warn anyone off this area of research, but a good systematic review on with, that has a lot of literature takes a little bit of time. And a lot of the time is um, expended in trying to identify studies and then code those studies for review. But I will talk. That is a topic for another webinar. Okay. Okay. So just to sort of conclude this section of um, of the webinar, um, different review method, methods produce different results. And traditional methods, as I've um, I think I've shown you today, can be haphazard and can sometimes lead to wrong conclusions. What we need to do is use scientific methods as we do in primary studies. We need to use those same scientific methods when we're planning and conducting systematic reviews. Um, uh, Ian Chalmers, Larry Hedges, Harris Cooper said, science is cumulative, but scientists rarely accumulate evidence scientifically. Um, and so we need to use and can use scientific principles um, and methods to synthesize evidence. And I just also wanted to just mention that another potential contribution of systematic review is to the current debate about replication in the social sciences and in, um, and in medicine. Um, research on power and meta-analysis can have direct application to replication studies. When we're asking the question about whether or not two studies replicate, what's Im embedded and implied in that question is also you know, how much power do we really have to detect a variation across different studies' effects? Um, and how much power do we have, statistical power, to examine association between study effects and study methods? Um, so just wanted to put a little plug in for systematic review in, in the current sort of debate about replication um, in both medi uh, medicine and the social sciences. So the what I wanted to end with here is just to give you um, uh, some, some sources and organizations that support systematic reviews. So I'm going to be talking about each of these in turn. Um, so we'll start with the Campbell Collaboration. Uh, so as uh, Joanne said at the beginning, the Campbell Collaboration is a non, um, actually a nonprofit international research network that produces and disseminates systematic reviews of the effects of interventions in the social and behavioral sciences. So we have coordinating groups in international development, crime and justice, education, social welfare, um, and we have the disability coordinating group. And I have the links here. Um, the Campbell Library is um, completely open access. So when you click on that link, you will have access to both um, the protocol and the review um, uh, of any given topic. So what we do in the Campbell Review is actually uh, provide authors with uh, reviews of their both their protocol before they start the review, and also of the completed review itself. And all of these 
um, protocols and reviews are um, open to um, open access to anyone who clicks on the link um, there. Uh, and again, these are on the effects of social um, and behavioral interventions. Um, and there are a number of resources there um, in the Campbell Collaboration for conducting uh, reviews. So the Cochrane Collaboration, if you've not heard of it, is, um, uh, is sort of the granddaddy of them all, um, established in 1993 in London. Um, the, the Cochrane Collaboration's mission is to promote evidence-informed health decision-making by producing high-quality, relevant, accessible, systematic reviews um, in, um, in the area of health. Um, now, these, they also have the same process as Campbell. Campbell is a sister organization to Cochrane, where they provide um, uh, study authors with reviews at the protocol and um, review stage. And that is, um, and they're all um, focused in on health, um, health-related, health and medical-related issues. But um, and met much of the Cochrane lab Library, however, is behind a firewall. Uh, some of you may be in an in institution that subscribes to Cochrane so that you're able to get those reviews. But I wanted to point out that one of the um, um, one very large contribution of Cochrane is actually the availability of the Cochrane Handbook for Systematic Reviews of Interventions. This is the official guide for preparing and maintaining Co Cochrane Systematic Reviews, and it is freely available at the link that I've given you here. And it's a really great resource on um, the whole process of doing systematic reviews, particularly on um, health interventions. Um, health interventions, um, systematic reviews tend to be a little bit different from um, uh, so social and behavioral interventions um, in the social sciences. Uh, there tend to be smaller numbers of studies, and the interventions tend to be um, not quite as diverse as what we have in the social sciences. But this is, the Cochrane Handbook is um, a great resource for people thinking about doing systematic reviews. Um, the American Academy of Neurology, and the links are there, um, they um, is a group that uses, um, th that actually produces or uh, systematic reviews and also guidelines for practice that are based on systematic reviews. They use a strict evidence-based methodology that follows the Institute of Medicine standards um, for systematic reviews. Um, and um, you can go on their website as well, and the link that says systematic reviews and, and guidelines at the bottom of the slide actually takes you to the set of systematic reviews um, in neurology that have been supported by the American Academy. Um, the Center for Evidence um, and Implementation um, is uh, based in Melbourne, um, and they work on three areas, uh, making sense of evidence, um, effectively implementing evidence and practice, and, um, and testing and evaluating and, and, and trials. So uh, they also produce um, systematic reviews um, and also evidence and gap maps. Um, and they're a nice source for um, uh, looking at another set of systematic reviews uh, in, in the field. Um, the Center for Evidence-Based Medicine, um, that is based in Oxford. Uh, established in 1995, they pr develop, promote, and promote and disseminate better evidence for healthcare, um, and they uh, also generate um, um, syntheses of high quality evidence of high quality evidence that benefits patients and society. They have a whole number of courses and training that you can pay for. They also have a library and a set of tools, um, um, and they maintain um, you know a, a, a set of systematic reviews. Uh, the Center for Reviews and Dissemination, or CRD, at, um, at York University um, is also a, it's, it's a department at York that specializes in evidence synthesis. Um, and they have completed over 200 high-quality systematic reviews in healthcare. Um, so they, they as well have courses and training um, publications. They, they themselves have produced a, um, also a document on doing systematic reviews, the um, CRD document on doing which I forgot to link here, but um, their document, they also have an also a free document that uh, talks about how to conduct a systematic reviews, and they maintain a database of abstracts of reviews called DARE. Um, I also want to note to you that um, 
uh, they have um, they maintain Prospero, which is an international perspective register of systematic reviews. So when you're starting a, starting out a systematic review, you can publish your protocol in Prospero for anyone to look at, um, and then it'll be there and freely available to the public. You know, once you complete the review. Um, the epicenter, or the Evidence for Policy and Practice Information and Coordinating Center, um, is a center um, that was established in 1993 in London. And the epicenter has had um, more than 25 years of experience in conducting and supporting systematic reviews um, in a wide range of areas in education, health, and social care. Um, they have uh, they offer a number of courses and seminars and a number of publications. I mentioned one um, that, that comes out of people in the epicenter. The, there's a um, book on systematic reviews by Goff, Oliver, and Thomas. Um, they're at the epicenter. They also have an online software tool um, called Epi Reviewer that helps you do the systematic review both from, you know, from start to finish, starting with the identification of studies and all the way through the meta-analysis part. Um, so they have lots and lots of, um, of support tools for doing uh, conducting systematic reviews. Um, the Joanna Briggs Institute, which is in um, Adelaide, Australia, um, is an international not-for-profit research and developmental development center in um, the, the University of Adelaide. Um, and they also conduct systematic review and support systematic reviews with um, training and courses, um, uh, uh, software system, and critical appraisal tools, and so forth. Um, so it's, um, they also have more resources on narrative reviews than some of the other um, uh, references I've given you so far. And finally, um, the National Academy of Sciences here in the United States um, established in um, a long time ago, 1863, um, is a private nonprofit society of distinguished scholars um, charged with providing independent objective advice um, to the nation on matters related to science and techno um, technology. Um, what's important to note here is the, um, uh, the 2011 publication on finding what works in healthcare standards for systematic reviews, also a um, a reference that is free to the public um, and also gives you standards for um, systematic reviews in healthcare. It's just a very nice, also a very nice um, guide for doing systematic reviews. So, so I think that concludes my remarks. I have a set of references here that if you download the presentation slides, um, you can um, look up some of the references I've um, just talked about. And I thank you for your time. And we have a little bit of time for questions as well. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Terry. That was a really good in-depth overview. And you covered such a wealth of information. I found your examples really helpful to show why a systematic review is a really valuable way to examine research findings um, and, and showing the, some of the dangers of relying on just narrative reviews. So let's see if the audience has any questions. I see a couple of people typing. Um, in the meantime, let me ask you one that came in. I think you touched on this a little. Um, you talked about the uh, libraries of Campbell and Cochrane. But one question is, where should we look to find systematic reviews? So um, they are indexed um, in, you know, in any of the major um, databases. Uh, you know, if you're in healthcare, they are. Um, indexed in um, PubMed. I don't know what the exact terms would be, but I would uh, meta-analysis, um, maybe it, uh, you need to look at under meta-analysis and also um, systematic review. Um, and uh, um, in the social sciences, they are also indexed. Um, depending on your you know, area of expertise, there are also particular journals that pub tend to publish these. Um, in psychology, that would be psych Psychological Bulletin and Education, its review of educational research, um, uh, and some of the major medical journals. Uh, I think those of you who are in healthcare know that these get published in the major medical journals. Great, thanks. Um, we do have a question from Teresa. Where does a critical interpretive synthesis fall in these categories that you've mentioned? Right, so I think what we haven't, um, so I would say that they would fall into um, because we've really been focusing a lot of, um, on 
the discussion of systematic reviews on what we would call aggr aggregative syntheses. And I would say that um, critical interpretive synthesis would probably fall into the category of doing a synthesis, um, a configurative synthesis, where we're really trying to understand, um, you know, we still use systematic techniques for getting the, the studies that are going to be included, but the, the goal of the synthesis is to understand something about that literature, whether it is, um, so that's where I would put the critical interpretive synthesis. Um, you're still using the same um, replicable techniques to get the studies, but the goal of, um, of the analysis of those studies is something about um, the concepts that are Im embedded in those studies. Okay, great. Here's another question. Um, I've heard this discussed, a review of reviews. What can you tell us about that? Okay. A review of reviews um, is actually, so that's like a systematic review of systematic reviews. So, so if there have been a number of systematic reviews on a given intervention, um, there are some emerging techniques to think about how to um, examine variation across systematic reviews on the same topic. Um, this is, an, like as I said, an emerging um, area of research um, in, in terms of trying to make sense of why systematic reviews differ from one another. So. Great. Thank you. Um, you mentioned uh, a lot about bias in traditional narrative reviews, and you did talk about the potential for bias in systematic reviews. Has this turned out to be a problem overall in systematic reviews, or does the process really help to keep out bias? Well, um, I think, as in a primary study, there's always the danger of bias creeping in. And I think um, what the goal is, as in primary studies, is to be as transparent about your methods as possible so that, um, so that someone who's reading your systematic review can understand where a bias might have crept in. Um, so when, that's why sometimes these reviews are so dense in reading them, because really what people are trying to do is to identify the methods they took so that they can guard against that bias. But as we know, it's always, you know, there's always a, you know, there's can always be um, bias in a review. Okay. We have another question from the audience. How yeah, important is it to register the systematic review before starting it? I think it's really important. Um, I think in th this day and age when we're really worried about, um, about biases, um, it's important to, uh, you know, to at least have a plan before you start. Because when you start doing one of these reviews, you realize that every day that you're doing a review, you make a decision that could impact something that might happen later. And if we have the registry um, ahead of time, then we know what we said we were going to do. And then we can talk about any deviations from that. In addition, I worry a lot about in systematic reviews, like as I worry about in primary studies, sort of fishing for results. So if we have the set of hypotheses um, laid out at the beginning of a um, systematic review, then we can guard against, you know, fishing for results in our, in our studies. Um, Joan, Joan, did you see this one about what is the best source of systematic reviews about knowledge transi translation? Yes. Uh, yes, I did. Okay. I, I can't answer that question. <laughs> Do you know? <laughs> Well, I don't know that there's one single source, but I was, uh, to respond to that, I thought we would um, identify some sources and then send uh, a reply to everyone. We will, have, we will be getting back to everyone, as Kathleen mentioned earlier, so we can send out that information uh, to the people that registered you know, for this webcast. And I think we've got time for maybe one more question at least. Um, what benefit is there to a systematic review that does not identify any effective interventions for whatever reason? So I always say that, um, uh, and this happens in the Cochrane collaboration and it's happened in Campbell, where we get what we call an empty review. Like there are no studies that fit the inclusion criteria. So if you can defend your inclusion criteria as being appropriate for that question. What that says to the world is that we don't have any good evidence about this. And we should really find, um, we should really support and, um, and do primary studies so that we have evidence about this particular intervention. Um, 
So I always think that just like null results are important, it's important to also, um, uh, you know, in a systematic review, also say we don't have we don't have the evidence and we need more evidence. Well, thanks very much, and thank you, Kathleen, uh, for answering the question about uh, information about systematic reviews about knowledge translation. Well, we're just about out of time, uh, but I would like to encourage everybody to go ahead and um, send us any questions that you think of later. Uh, we do have, go through the references here, we do have uh, Terry's email address here, and you can also contact us at the Center on KTDRR at ktdrr at AIR.org and we'll get those questions to Terry, and we'll make sure that we get a response um, that we can share with everybody. And this, we want to thank you um, very much. I want to thank Terry Piggott for taking time to prepare and give us this overview today of systematic reviews and research synthesis in an effort to ensure that evidence-based information may have greater impact. And I want to thank everyone for participating this afternoon. We hope you will take a few minutes to give us some feedback about the webcast, by filling out the brief evaluation. You can see the link um, that's right here, and I think Shoshana also just uh, posted the link in the chat box. If you click on that, you'll go right to the evaluation. We'll also be sending out an email with the evaluation link to everyone who is registered. So um, finally, I want to thank everyone from all the AIR staff and representatives from the Campbell Collaboration who helped with planning and logistics and, of course, we want to thank Nidler for their support to offer these webcasts and other events. We also want to invite you to attend the second webcast in this series, Basic Steps and Procedures for a Campbell Systematic Review, that will take place on Wednesday, March 20th, at the same time. We are pleased to bring back Dr. Terry Piggott as our presenter. And as a courtesy, everyone who registered for today's session will be registered for the other sessions in the series. And finally, we invite everyone to visit our recently refreshed and updated website at www.ktdrr.org.